If you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to turn to the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 9. And as you're turning there, um, uh, pray for Donna. She uh, hopefully is logged in. That was her plan. Uh, and so um, she tried Wednesday night and it didn't quite work out. So uh, she hopefully will be praying for us anyway. Ezra chapter 9, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Ezra chapter 9, in the first verse, the Bible says, Now, when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abomination, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, and the Moabites, and the Egyptians. Excuse me, the Egyptians and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand, the hand of the princes and the rulers have been chief in this trespass. And when I heard these thing, and when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off my the hair off my hand and out of my beard and sat down and stunned. Mm. And there and there were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the Lord of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord, my God. And I said, Oh, my God, I am shamed and I blush and I, and to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass has grown up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we, we have we been in a great trespass unto this day. For our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, have been delivered into the uh, sword of the captivity and to a spoil to the confusion of face as it is this day. And now for a little while, and now for a little space of grace have been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape, and to give us a nail in the holy place. Our God may be light in our eyes, give us a little reviving in our bondage. I'll be preaching this morning, the Lord being my helper, on the cost of revival. Mm. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for another day to meet in your house. Lord, another Lord's Day that you've given us to worship and glorify you for who you are. Lord, we pray that our service would be outside this place and our worship would be here. God, help us as a people together that we might bond closely together. Lord, that we might not see others' thoughts, but we might see each one as a treasure. Pray, Lord, tonight, uh, this morning for the sick, for Joey, uh, for Brother Junior, for Sister Heather, Lord, that you might cause them to be renewed in the Lord and that their sickness would go away. God, we pray that we might feast on your word this morning because we know it's not natural to man, but our spirit ought to crave it as it should. God bless your word, send a revival to your people in this day that we live, and we be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Yeah. Now, uh, I've heard about revival most of my life, and I've heard about revivals of old, and I've heard people my age and, <coughs> and younger, like Brother Kenny and Brother Jarrett, uh, that we would just like to see a revival, that we would like to see something like it was in the Great Awakening, or even what was 50, 60, 70 years ago, where God's people got right and revival was the result. Now, to understand revival, you have to know what it is. Reviving is just like, and all you know, Brother Clarence Grigsby, uh, me and Donna revived him. Uh, he had a heart attack over there at the Paducah Church. We did CPR, and 
uh, I used to get a card every every anniversary of that day from Brother Grigsby, uh, uh, and that's reviving. You, you know why it was revival? Because Brother Grigsby was already alive. Uh, revival can't come to dead people. That's the work of the Almighty. Right. But now, revival can come to his people, even in the day which we live. You know, sometimes I get a little sick about hearing, oh, we're in the last days. This is the best we can do. Well, I have to say that all you're doing is limiting God. Amen. And God can do what seems good unto himself, but now revival, if we really want it, if we really crave it, and we truly want to hear from God, it's going to cost you something. Right. Uh, you can't be with your Laodicean attitude and, oh, bless me if you can, dear preacher, and the result will be a revival. You're right. It will not happen that way. And, and so we find that these were some things that Ezra saw. Now, if you know teachings of Ezra and Nehemiah, they came in a, a great day of, uh, of, uh, of banishment and trying to get back to Israel, trying to restore the house of God and trying to resume worship. Now, that is, that is the very emphasis of revival, is a craving for things better than you presently have. And you, know, you know what was uh, wrong with Laodicea? There was two things. One, time, one thing, they got focused on money. And the other thing is they were satisfied with how it was. Uh, the, worst, uh, the worst thing that we can happen as a people is to become satisfied in the service of the Lord rather than seeing new opportunities as they present themselves. In the first verse, uh, Ezra writes, now when these things were done, now you can read eight, 7 and 8 this week, but what was done was the restoration of the temple. Now God blessed miraculously in that. They rebuilt the wall, and uh, you know how they did that? Uh, every man, what a little bit of the wall ran in front of his house, they repaired that that was right in front of their house, and their neighbor man did that, and his neighbor did that, and the wall was rebuilt in an incredible amount of time. Now what that indicates, church, is personal responsibility. You do the wall in front of your house, and I'll do the wall in front of my house, and you know what? We'll get the job done. See, we don't like personal responsibility. Oh, that's the preacher's job. Uh, you know, the two preacher boys at the church, let Jerry and Kenny and Larry take care of it all. No, you do the part in front of your house, and I'll do the part in front of mine. And so and in that way, we each take a responsibility. So all that work was done, and they had a restored building for the worship of God, but they didn't have the presence of God. You know, uh, you can't worship God if his presence is not near. It, it's an impossibility. And, 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 and what we find that Ezra finds is that uh, in most of his days, in most of the history of Israel, that had been their case. They thought they had God with them, and they didn't. Yeah, you, had, you know, you met people that were deceived and weren't really saved and were saved much later. That was kind of Israel's situation. They never met with God uh, any great power. You know, the last one you really see that, that and, and at the end of his life, he messed up, was in the days of Solomon. And after that, there would be a good one and a bad one and a good one and a bad one, and on down the line, and what it left was a people that really didn't understand worship and didn't know what it meant to be with God. Yeah. And you know, I believe we've come there again, don't you? You know, uh, uh, the church is very much likened unto Israel, and we can get in the same way. If you read the, uh, the seven church letters in the book of the Re at the beginning of the book of the Revelation, that is what was happening. They were getting in the same situation except for Philadelphia, and they had a little bit more going for them. Now, when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves. Now, you know everybody, well, Brother Larry, why do you harp on separation so much? Well, I'll tell you why. It's tied to the presence of God. 
And if you don't, if you don't separate yourself, don't you think God's going to come around and bless your sin because He's not going to? You know what? You know why our sovereign grace churches are so cold? I fully believe it. It's because we've not separated ourselves. We're not any different than the world. We don't listen to anything different than the world. We don't. We uh, our, 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 uh, all our time is consumed by Facebook and other internet and, and watching things on TV. And there's no time left for the Almighty. We've not separated ourselves. And so I want you to see that he can't, and, and he included the whole body. Uh, and, but it did come, a, it, it did take a priest to come and say, hey, we've got a problem. How, how, how many, how much do you see that today? Well, they'll come and say, uh, you know what, there's a big problem. The, you know, that takes a man with a pretty strong backbone, don't it? And I tell you what, and, and you two brothers, you listen to me, you won't get invited to preach everywhere when you say, hey, we've got a problem. There, there's a difficulty going on. And because, see, people want a health and wealth message, and even among sovereign gracious, we certainly don't want to point out that God's no longer meeting with his people. And then if you point that out and you begin to point out why, listen, I hope you make it out there okay. Because people don't like it. And so uh, we see the responsibility that Ezra that uh, these people come and say listen the problem is this it's separation. The people have not separated themselves from the lands doing not uh, doing according to the abominations even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, and the Moabites the Egyptians and the Amorites. So he said, this is the problem. They took up their cultural practices and they brought them with them. The best and most easiest one that you can think of was when uh, uh, they were leaving Egypt with, 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 their, with their wives and in her shadow, Rachel kept her gods. You remember that? She, she, she wanted what? Daddy Laban had told her to do, and she and the Bible literally says that she hid it in her stuff. And and that's the problem. You know what? We just need to get down to exactly what the Bible says. And if it upsets people, all I know is that it upsets them. Uh, and so we find them, they recognize this about themselves, and they confess it. They confessed it. They said, listen, this is the problem. We don't no longer have a pure people, and we, don't, we no longer have a pure truth. It's been mingled with the world. It, it, it's been mixed up with the things that the world has to offer. Verse 2, this was the reason, for they've taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons. We do not need mixed marriages. You know, you, you know, you will say that I'm foolish, but I don't want my sons or daughters to marry Methodist people. And you might say, well, that's a bad way to say it. Well, I don't know any other way to say it, do you? That's a mixed multitude. Uh, my boys went long and far to find them good, decent wives, and one of them to the north end of the country and the other one to the south end of the country. Uh, of the country. But you know what? It was the right thing to do. Otherwise, what you end up having is a big multitude. And because, see, there'll be always little things that you can't agree on. I won't say his name, but many of you knew him. If, if I did say his name, good preacher, loved the Lord, but he married a Campbellite as a young man. And you know what? The end result, until she died and she did outlive, and he did outlive her, his ministry was void. And the reason why. It was a mixed multitude. And so we certainly need to be cautious and careful of that. And Ezra saw that as the, as the problem that was bringing them down. And they just kind of laid it all out there. You know, I would to God this morning that we as Baptist people, you remember when, uh, when the king went up into the temple and, and the enemy was on its way and he said he took it all out. And he got that little note, he got that little note and said, listen, we're coming to get you. And he just laid it all out before the Lord. You know, where did that go in people that follow the Lord? And I'll tell you where it went. We're embarrassed. 
that filthy, ungodly pride that this gut flesh is so full of. You know what? I need to admit, listen, I have problems. I have difficulty. Sometimes I have difficulty focusing on the things of God. I look out there, and, 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 and listen, the world will pull you to it. I've been working the floor a whole lot at the nursing home because it's no admissions, and we just don't have much staff. And everybody's like, man, you should just give up that other job. You're, you're too good of a, of a regular nurse. And you know what? You like those accolades. You know, man, you're in your 50s, and you can get them meds out before I can. Sounds good to the flesh. But see, what I, what I need is to be in a position where I might serve the Almighty. And, and so we find then that they recognize them about themselves, and they recognize and have understanding that there is an issue, and we all sometimes get to that point, but then do what, what do we do with it? Verse 3, And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair out of my head and my beard, he sat down astonished or astonished. Now, why was Ezra surprised? Why was Ezra astonished? Now, he had been over uh, as a captive, and he thought back home they were serving God. He thought back home out of the Babylonian uh, uh, captivity that they were doing great and wonderful things. They'd been left there as a piece of God's people. And when he got there, what he found out was they in worse shape than they were in captivity. See, uh, Ezra couldn't hardly believe it. You ever been in a situation and the Lord just comes by and, and, and puts his presence on you and you're just astonished in what a mess you are, and you think everything is just as good as gold. Yeah. See, that, that was the type of situation Ezra found himself in, and he couldn't believe what, what a miserable shape those people were in. He couldn't believe the situation. And uh, verse 4 says, And then, uh, then there were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of, of the God of Israel. Now, I ask you sincerely, you don't have to raise your hand, but you answer within your heart, do you really tremble at the word of God? When it says it, are you so moved by it that you take it to be the word of the Almighty God, Jehovah? That you take it literally as it's the spoken, breathed word of God. Because listen, that's what it is. And if you get to the point you regard the Bible for exactly that, if you're really saved, you'll respect the word of God a lot more than you did before. Amen. It, it's not just somebody's ideas. It's not just some, what somebody's written down on a book. Listen, it's the very living, mighty word of God. And, and, and we need to get back to that and understand if you want revival, this is what it takes. Then were they assembled unto me, every one that trembled at the words of God, the word of God of Israel. Now, I want you to see that wasn't a whole camp. You know what? There's people today that don't tremble at the word of God. And, and, and a lot of times they could care less, to be honest. And I'm not talking about out there. I'm talking about in here. <laughs> That, that if the word, you know, yeah, yeah, I've heard that before. I've heard it a thousand times. You know what? We need to tremble at the word of God. Listen, if it says it's black, it's as black as night. And if it's white, it's white as the shirt I have on this morning. And we need not compromise it one iota. How did, how did the Lord's people get in a mess in that day? They let the world in the door. You know what? I want New Testament to grow, but listen, I, I, I'm wary of fast growth. Right. I'm very wary of fast. You, you know what grows fast in the human body? Cancer. It really does. It, it, it grows faster than normal body cells. So you need to be very cautious of fast growth. If you do, and I won't say it, but there was there was a Baptist church. I use that word loosely down in Southern Montgomery County down there, and and and, and they had this big charismatic preacher thing to go right there. It was like up to four hundred in a year, and boom, <laughs> the man was caught up with another woman. So be careful of fast growth. And so they found themselves stunned. Just they couldn't believe the mess that they were in. 
They couldn't believe that they had come down to such a state. Ezra was blown away. But they had the temple re uh, remains. And, and they were right there where they ought to be and not doing a thing <coughs> for the uh, service of God. Then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of the Lord of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I said, astonished into the evening sacrifice. So that's from about lunch to about six in the evening. He just stood there and, and he just sat there in disbelief. Now, there is where most people are satisfied today. Oh, man. Man, oh, man. If it could be just like it was back in the 50s. Man, oh, man. But see, Ezra had enough spirituality to know that had to be short-lived. You know what? You can't just mumble and groan. You just got to get up and go on. Right. And that, that's exactly what Ezra does in verse 5. And as the evening sacrifice, and at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness, sorrow, bitterness, uh, depression. He, he got up out of it, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. See, he knew the only answer to this situation was prayer. Now, you think about your own prayer life. I don't need to know about it. But he, he stood there and began to pray like this. You know, there's a lot about positions of prayer in the Bible. Sometimes it's face down. Sometimes it's standing. Sometimes it's just like this. What Ezra just left out and said, you know what? we got a problem See, we abide way too long in that little section where he said, astonished, don't we? You know, the filth that's going on in that world out there, I'm not astonished by it anymore, are you? I really am not. Because, and, and you know, this is the real thing. I don't even focus on that. And you know, according to the Word of God, that ain't going to get any better. Right. Brother here was telling me that yesterday we was riding around at some uh, wedding that a friend of his was going to go uh, do in the hitching. And he got to looking at one of the bridesmaids, and it was a man. And that brother walked out. I'm like, well, bless be God for that. And that's where we're at. <laughs> and for a minute, I, 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 brother... Uh, can't even play how crazy because I said, I'm like, man, I've heard it all. <laughs> and you just got to get going. We went down a little further down the road and found Paul Epps, started talking about a building. See, we need to understand that this can't overconsume the mission spirit of the church of the living God. And so we, uh, <coughs> we have to stay focused. Verse 6. This is his prayer. He said, Oh my God, I'm ashamed and I blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. See, that was a really understanding of his nature, was it not? How many, how many times do you see people blush? It's about over with. I know uh, uh, used to, before COVID came, uh, our morning meeting time at the nursing home was lots of fun, and we'd laugh and cut up. And sometimes somebody would uh, say something that would embarrass me, and of course I'd turn red from here up. And they said at that time, this girl looked at me and said, you're the only 50-year-old man I've never seen that blushes. And I said, and I looked at her and thought about it, and I said, well, bless be God. <laughs> and I, and I, I hope I still get embarrassed, you know, because... Uh, we get so used to sin that it doesn't bother us, it doesn't embarrass us. We're the one with the problem. Right. And, and, and so we find then, as in Ezra this day, he was so <coughs> embarrassed about his nation as he lifted up his hands toward God, he blushed to look in the face of God by the, uh, because of the transgressions of Israel. Notice he understands the problem, and this is us. If we want revival, and we, want, we have to understand revival. It says, since the days of my fathers, and, uh, since the days of our fathers. And uh, I was talking to Brother Junior about Mama's cousin, my cousin Patricia, that we buried yesterday. She was kin on both sides of the house, is what Mama always said, because 
mama, mama's mama and Patricia's mama were sisters, and Patricia's dad and my granddad were first cousins. And, and and they uh, they were double kin is what they used to call it back then. And I, I want you to see it as he's looking here. He looks into the nature and the depravity, and it had just gotten worse. You know you know why people need to be saved is because they're inherently evil from the moment they come from the womb. And we find that Ezra recognized that, and further he recognized, hey, it's getting worse. It's just getting better. We need revival. Listen, uh, a revival is not a series of five meetings, right? A revival is a work, is a work completely given to God. You're right. He accomplishes it out of his mercy and grace, but he will not accomplish it until we take after the pattern of Ezra, and then you'll see God come down. And until then, I don't think that he will. <coughs> and so... He says, since the days of our father have we been in great trespass or an error against the law unto this day for our iniquities, uh, for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hands of the kings of the lands and the sword of captivity and to us fall and to the confusion of the face as is this day. Now, I want you to see, and the next time you get the hummy grubbies about President Biden, you remember this. That's the kind that the world wants. Right. He says, we've trespassed that with our kings for years. See, the only thing they don't want to do is be honest about it. Uh, you know what? I really believe since the majority of the nation is sinners, you're not a good Christian man. I don't think there's enough of Unless God just wants to vote him in, there's certainly not enough of us to vote him in. God can place him there. But... I want you to see that that's kind of what you have in government is a mirror of the nation. Nancy Pelosi, you know what she is? She's a mirror of California. She's just like every bit of the rest of the buck that's out there. That is. And so we find that Ezra recognized that, and he recognized how it was impacting his people spiritually. You know, I was talking to another cousin of mine on Facebook. And then she, uh, she was one of them riding with Biden. But, well, you ride with her, and I don't know where you're going to get off. But now I told her, and I said, listen, I said, I'm not mad at you. I said, for no, I understand. He won the election. And I said, unlike you, I will honor him and pray because he is my president. But I want you to see the Democratic agenda. And I said, you look at their statement concerning abortion. Well, I don't support abortion. And I, I said, you can't have it both ways. Either you support that man and his program, or you don't. Right. And, and, and you know what? She hadn't spoke to me since. And you know, I'd say, so be it. But looking what you're connected to may be hindering your revival. Does this come first? Or does watching the TV game? Does this come first? Or going to work. Does this come first? Or going out for the night, going to the movie, going, going, going out to eat, whatever you want to put on it, does this take priority? And if it doesn't, the problem's with you. You're exactly right. Amen. The problem's with you. And so we find then that Ezra kind of laid it out there and he so desired the presence of the Lord, he wanted to see the, the fire come down as in days of old. He wanted to hear the, the literal voice of God as in the end in Moses' day. He so craved revival, he was willing to be honest. You know what? I so crave revival that I'm willing to be honest about myself and about my family. We don't do everything that we should do. This doesn't always take priority. And if every one of you would be in, uh, in, be honest with me as I am with you, you would say the very same thing. But if you want revival, this has to come first. Amen. And that's what Ezra had gotten down to and, he, and he, he confessed that before the Almighty. Now notice what he says in verse 8. Now for a little space, grace has been showed from the Lord our God. You know, all we need is, is just a little bit, just a little space. 
And, and I think about that in the time of eternity. I don't really know what a space is. Do you? Now, my space thus far, about two weeks, will be 52 years. And you look at that time of eternity, you know, that is just a little space. Now, sometimes we think of a revival. You know, uh, I've heard in Laston when God really came down and met with them for 30, 40 days. I mean, wouldn't that be some tremendous thing to see? But then a lot of time to hurry, that's just, you know what I'm wanting? I'm just wanting a little space. Just that much that God's people can meet with God. We can understand Him. We can feel His presence. He is saving folks. He's making the church right. Just a little space. Listen, if it didn't last but a week, if God was really meeting with us, oh, how I would love that. That would be fine with me. Yeah. We need a space of grace where God meets with us. And listen, it doesn't matter anything else about around this world. If we meet with God, he will bless us. Amen. You know, uh, I've got the point, and I've been praying for it for some time. That's what's important to me. That's what I crave is just hearing from God. Amen. And you know what? That don't come like that. You know how that attitude comes? It comes by prayer. Right. I preached a message on prayer a couple of Sundays ago, I think. I hope you took it home and began to apply it to your life. Because, see... That's your spiritual barometer. You want to know how strong you are in the Lord? You tell me about your prayer life. You tell me when you pray. You tell me what you lay out before the Lord. Tell me how much hallelujah that you give Him. And I, and I, I, I guarantee you from that, I can, uh, I can tell you pretty much spiritually where you're at. You know what we, we do in nursing? We call it history. And say, uh, Sarah came in to me, and I'm like, well, what brought you in today, Sarah? Well, I'm feeling this, and I'm feeling that, and, you know, then I'm like, well, let me listen to you, Belly, and we draw assessments and say, you know what, this is what you need. Very same thing. Look at yourself, listen to yourself, and where are you at? See, uh, these people were honest, and if you read, I think it's Nehemiah's accounting of the same thing, man, they got down to the point they was divorcing or leaving women that were not their own. They, the, the, these ones that they had said, listen, we, we've been breeded with, with the, world's, the world's people, and the Bible says in that accounting, they left them, they give up what the world had for them because serving God meant everything to them. And see, until serving God means everything to you, you'll continue just as you're doing right now. And then when it, when it changes, and it becomes that this, this is paramount. This is the only thing that really lasts us through eternity. Listen, revival will come. Well, our God is a faithful God. He's a good God. And when, whenever we are faithful to Him, revival will come. We just, we just need to align ourselves as they did. And He, said, and he talks about the space uh, of grace. And now for a little space, grace has been shewed under the Lord our, from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape. Now, I thought it's very unusual wording because number one, they had the authorization from the king to rebuild the temple. So they weren't escaping the king. And the people there had measures of freedom because they never went into captivity. So they weren't escaping the king. So what were they escaping from? The world. They were escaping from the world. You know, you, you know how you're going to get right with the Lord and escape from the world. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how you get right from the Lord. Now one day I was just I was going through the nursing home this before things got crazy. And I believe I counted 67 exits out of that building. And it's not that well, it is a big building, but uh, 67 ways that you can get out. See, there's a way to escape. If, if you're sick of the way things are, there's a way to escape. Turn yourself unto the Lord. Look unto Him from which cometh our help, and He'll give you the means to serve Him. And, and so what we need, he, he, he recognized what they needed was an escape from this world, that they could set this world aside even for a little while 
and leave what and leave it behind. To leave us a remnant, meaning a small amount of people, a small amount of individuals. We don't need uh, uh, one of the biggest revivals in, in, in our nation history started with three people in a haystack. And so God can send those things with just a remnant. A remnant is the end of a uh, of a fold of fabric. If you buy a, a whole boat at the end, it's always wrinkly and messy. That's the remnant, and that's all you need. Now, it don't have to be perfect. It don't have to be good. You just need the remnant. And he uh, he prayed he uh, he prayed for that. Notice and to give us a nail in the holy place. My my, he did that on the cross of Calvary. Did he not? Listen, we have a strong and mighty nail in the holy place. Remember, uh, uh, the Bible says after the, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, it says the veil, the veil of the temple went from the top to bottom and ripped open until there was now a nail in the holy place. See, we have that. We have that advocate. We have that intercessor. We have that person of Christ going between us and the, and the God Almighty at any disposal at any time. And notice then the rest of that. God may lighten our eye. Now, if we have the nail, and we do, the next thing that we need is our eyes opened up. Remember what he said to the churches? He that had an ear, let him hear. Right. In other words, there were some deaf people in there, wasn't there? If I do this, and I do this, I can't even see my daughter and my granddaughter to know who they are. I can't hear enough. I barely can hear myself speak right now. And that's a real problem, isn't it? Now, if we're like that spiritually, why can't we see that as a problem? Yeah. You know, I ordered me some new glasses on Friday. And uh, the reason was, these were really messing up, and getting foggy, looking things dirty all the time. I, I got me some more glasses. But spiritually, if I couldn't see well, would I go get me some more glasses? And would you? And if spiritually you couldn't hear well, would you be willing to go get you a hearing aid? Um, I remember when I first got my real hearing aids, and people was like, aren't you embarrassed for them? You're a young man. And you know what my response was? Not at all, because now I can hear. See, it really, are you going to go with what looks good? Or are you going to go with the benefit of your soul? Because see, that word's going to take hide, hair, and all. But do you want that, or do you want to sit around in our stupidity? Mm. See, we need revival. We need to hear this. We need to understand where our issues are. And so, and in the days of Ezra, he made it. He made it very, very plain that the God that God would open up their eyes and that they would see what was going on. God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. Now, of course, they were talking about literal, literal bondage because they were under the worship authority of the Babylonians, but I want you to see you are still bound to your flesh. This flesh is not pleasant. It's not good. It's not happy. You, you know what? Focusing on this flesh will make you a person most miserable. Well, that person didn't like me. That person didn't do this. That person didn't do that. So what? That's the devil's practice to bring you down as low as he can get you. And, and so we find what we ought to then do is focus on the Lord God. Not focus on the here and now, but focus on what the Lord God has for us. And give us a little reviving in our bondage. Even though we're in the flesh, even though that we uh, still possess the, the, the problems of the flesh, revival can come. Do you believe it or not? It's not outside God's capability. He's done it time and time and time again. Real revival. You know, when I first came to the truths of sovereign grace, I went to a few meetings. And, you know, you pre you pre be preaching. And then, what about all you get? Man. You know, someone when you put the A on the B. Man. Right. And you, you know why they do that? They're afraid they look like something else. 
or maybe just maybe they need revival. But I see when the Lord gets a hold of you, you ain't gonna worry about what you look like, what you sound like, how you're gonna embarrass yourself in front of other people. What will only become your only thing is what's between you and the Lord God Almighty. That is revival. When set all this other stuff aside. And your relationship with God is the very center of your life. And it, it, it doesn't happen very often. It, it's only happened to me a few times in the entirety of my 50 plus years. But a few times I knew that without a shadow of a doubt that the only thing that really matters when y'all take me out here is the time I've spent with Christ. And, and, and we need to get there. We need to be back in that position. That in and of itself is revival. Verse 9. For we have, for we were bondmen, not anymore, but for we were bond, for we were bondmen, yet God had not forsaken us in our bondage, but extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia, and give us a reviving to set up the house of God. And to, uh, and to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. Now, I want you to see midway there, it says to repair the desolation. Have you ever felt desolate? Now, uh, I never feel much desolation around here because I know just about every crook and cranny is through a county. But I remember one time I had been preaching a meeting up in Idaho where Dessa's mom, mom and dad are from. And going home, they took me through Phoenix. But, and because the cheapest tickets, you will go all over the world to get back to Dover. And uh, so as we were going, uh, just miles and miles and miles of nothing but desert. And I got to thinking, if I was down there, I'd feel pretty desolate. Because number one, I wouldn't know where to go. And number two, there's nothing to drink. And number three, it's hot. And it's dry, and it will scare me to death, right? Then why don't we get scared to death spiritually? Because you know what, church? It's hot, and it's dry, and there's not a lot of water around, and we're okay with it. We're okay with it. I'm sick of being okay with it. Are you? Right. I'm sick of saying, hey, this is status quo. It's what we have to deal with. No, no, because our God brought a great revival in one of the most desolate histories of the nation of Israel. Verse 10, and now, O our God, he's still praying, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments. Now I'm going to say something very briefly about this and we're about to close. Do not forsake the law of God. You say, well, the law, the law is covered by grace. Amen? Well, amen. <laughs> but the law is our schoolmaster. You're right. It still teaches us a whole, whole lot. Even in December of 2020, it's still telling us what's right is right. right. And what wrong, what's wrong is wrong. You, you know why men can marry men and women can marry women in the United States? It's because they have forsaken the law of God. You're right. You know, you know why you know why babies are killed before they're born? Because men have forsaken the exactly laws of right. God. And listen, we we've convinced ourselves, hey, there's nothing we can do about it. Well, we can cry out against it. Ezra did. You're right, amen. Ezra cried out against amen. it. Amen. This is wrong, right? And if we want revival, if we really want a revival that we can tell our children and grandchildren about, listen, we're going to have to start crying out about <laughs> sin around us and just quit taking it far from the course. Now, what will she, now, and now, our God, what should we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by thy servants, the prophets, the land into which we go to possess it, it is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands and their abominations which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanliness. Now, I want you to notice this and we're going to, we're going to close. He says, listen, the nation around us, it says it's filled from one end to the other with their uncleanliness. So we need a bunch of ungodly people in this church. No. I don't want these people to feel with uncleanliness to you. 
Now, I want people to hear the gospel. But at the very same time, listen, you watch people when they get in control. Uh, those of you that went with us to Bumps Mills, I think the one man, every time I think along those lines, uh, Brother L.G. Richardson had him pegged the first time he seen him. And, uh, uh, but we took him at his word, didn't we? We, did, we didn't wait to see how things were going. And he ended up being Jezebel. He ended up being a false prophet. And a lot of the contributions of the church splitting at Bumpus Mills. See, what we need to do, this is for us. This is for us. We've come together to worship. Read your sign out there. We've come to worship. This is not a missionary time. I always want to preach the gospel. But listen, this is for us to worship and lift up God. I think that's what's flipped us around with such an Armenian theology that every time someone climbs into the pulpit, they have to say, just trust Jesus. Right. No, this is us to say, Lord God of Ipidus reigneth. Amen. Thou art good in mercy. Your mercies endure from generation to generation. Yes. That's what this service Amen. is about. That's where revival comes from. You're right. Now, I guess probably the oldest person in here is Brother Junior. And I would say his memory may go back to the mid 40s, early 40s, maybe, down it. And he'd be willing to tell us probably that um, revivals have been few and far between. But I think. The cause, the root cause is this, is that it's pride. You know what? It's a very ongoing thing to have to say, you know what? I've really messed up. Uh, it's a very ongoing thing to say, hey, listen, I'm cold in my heart. I don't know what's going on with me, but I've not heard from God in a long time. That's a very ungling thing, is it not? And, and more unbelievable than that is to phrase it that way. I've not heard from God. Not that He's not spoken to me. I've not heard it. Taking on that, that responsibility. Do you want a revival? Do you want to hear from God in such a mighty way that we would be talking about it for years to come? Well, it starts with you. Yeah. It starts with taking on the humbleness of Christ. Remember, remember when the, in John's Gospel when they came to arrest the Lord and he said, I'm sick you. And they flew back on the rocks. Mm -hmm. See, he had that power. Mm -hmm. And he set it aside. What for the betterment of us? What about you? Are, are you willing to set that pride aside? Listen, he had, the, he had all the ability of Almighty God stowed in that flesh. But yet and still, for our benefit, he was humble. See, what we need key to revival is being humble yourself. Yeah. And say, hey, I'm the problem. Or hey, I've got an answer. Hey, let's do this. Let's meet over at my house just for a prayer meeting. See, that's how things begin. So what about you? Where are you? This morning, 